And we're working towards uh, defining these three key points, okay? Muckrakers, does everybody remember what a muckraker is? Okay, good, we're gonna talk about that. Exploitation, which we've hit on a little bit already, believe it or not, and reform. So I'm gonna give you a sheet of paper. It's gonna be some guided notes. As we go over these things in the presentation, I want you to uh, just take notes at your own, um, at your own page. You'll, you'll hear me hit on it. Go for it. Okay, there's way too many of those that there are people. Um, so who remembers what a muckraker is? Give me your idea. What's Yeah, tenement housing and child labor and what we're going to get into today, which is uh, which is deplorable work conditions and food sanitation, that kind of thing. So muckrakers were journalists, right? Muckrakers were journalists of the progressive era who sought to expose corruption in big business and government. The work of muckrakers influenced the passage of key legislation that strengthened protections for workers and consumers. What's a consumer? Someone who buys or uh, consumes product. Exactly. So uh, the people are the workers, they're the producers, the consumers are the people who buy the goods. Okay, so there's your definition. You were right on it. Can you think in your head kind of like what muckraker, where they might have gotten that idea? So I'll tell you. Uh, so really in these meatpacking plants that we're going to talk about from uh, the jungle, uh, they literally, the floors were so dirty and nasty that they had to use a rake to rake the dirt, the blood, the spit, everything off the floor. And the president at the time, Teddy Roosevelt, coined the term muckraker. And the journalists who he was talking about kind of liked it, so it's done. But it makes a lot of sense because basically they're cleaning the dirt off the floor. So some really important muckrakers, these journalists, political activists, were Upton Sinclair. Um, Jacob Reese. Jacob Reese um, did a lot of work on tenement housing. Lincoln Steffens. There was a magazine at the time called McClure's. And McClure's was the main uh, source uh, where these journalists were able to publish their information to uh, the public. So McClure's did a lot of, uh, helped a lot of these journalists get this information to the public uh, in this magazine. That's where they published a lot of their stuff. Uh, Florence Kelly. And you mentioned photojournalism, and Lewis Hine was a photographer, so still, still journalism. Images are powerful, right? Like when you see something with your own eyes, it's, uh, it's uh, powerful. Um, all right, so moving on, we got muckrakers, and that's where we're going to move because we're about to talk about a really famous one who's almost a muckraker by accident, according to him. He considered himself an author. His name's Upton Sinclair, and he wrote a book called The Jungle. All right, and The Jungle was a book about uh, meatpacking plants in Chicago town, or Chicago, and uh, the surrounding area where all the people lived in their tenement housing was called Packing Town. These people were crammed into these tiny houses uh, and worked 10 to 12 hours a day for three to five cents an hour um, six days a week, you know, one day off. So, what's a typical work week now? Five, five days a week, 40 hours. If you work more than 40, you get paid extra, right? You think if you're working 12 hour, hour days for a nickel, you think they're paying you anything extra? No. So, this is long, hard work. So, Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle in 1906. Um, that's him. That's what the book originally looked like. And his big quote from this, and we'll get into uh, a little bit why it's important, is he said, uh, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. Okay? So, um, 
when Upton Sinclair wrote this book, his the point of him writing it was uh, he wanted to expose expose the plight of the worker. Okay, not as much the food industry, but we're going to get into the food industry because there's some uh, there's some interesting stuff going on. So Upton Sinclair was an American political activist and muckraker. Um, he was the author of almost 100 books, most well known for his novel The Jungle, which went on to be published in eight languages and made him a millionaire. Um, he actually opened a commune after that. Uh, so this was a really important book worldwide, not just in the United States. Um, in 1904, Upton Sinclair went undercover. He dressed himself up in poor people's clothes, uh, pretended to be an immigrant worker, and went into one of the meatpacking plants in Chicago for seven weeks to write this book, okay? So, um, and he used what he learned to write the book, The Jungle. Uh, the interesting thing about The Jungle is it's not like a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff you would read in McClure's or whatever. It's actually a story. So even though we would call this um, a primary source because he dressed up and wrote it, if you read the book, the book is about a fictional family. So it's kind of confusing. Still a primary source, because he's there, he's the one watching it, he's the one writing about it. But the book itself is a story about this family, um, most of whom in the family worked in this meatpacking plant. So they employed people as young, like kids as young as 14 to do these incredibly dangerous jobs. Um, and uh, like I said, the main point of what he was writing about was not the gross food, which, we're gonna read some stuff and it's gross, uh, but was about um, the plight of these workers, okay? Um, by 1904, most of Chicago's packing house workers were immigrants from Poland, Slovakia, Lithuania. Um, so these are Eastern European countries. Um, they were crowded in tenement houses and apartments and rented rooms in packing house. We talked about that, that's the slums that are adjacent to these giant, giant, factories where they produce meat. Um, so the stockyards is where they kept the, uh, kept the cows, and I'm gonna show you all some pictures of those, it's just terrible. And then right next to that, there are four city dumps. What a wonderful, wonderful world. Um, so I'm gonna hand every table two pictures, okay? One, I'm gonna show you the, uh, you're gonna see a picture of the stockyards, and I want you to think about the way these animals were herded into these uh, stockyards. You'll see the individual fences. There's ramps that lead what looks like for miles um, up to like the Swift factory, the Armor factory. Those were the big packing plants at the time. Um, so as I pass these out, I really want you to pay attention to the details. Um, and I want you to kind of discuss what you see. And I'm also gonna give you a picture to look at. And I really, really want you to look at the details of that. So I want you to get an idea of how dangerous these places were to work. Um, but a picture of these workers working in this place. And along with that, the last thing you're gonna get is a little quote from the jungle, and I want you to read it. Uh, one person at your table read it out loud, and then I want each of you to kind of look it over. And then I want you to discuss at your table kind of what you think, and then we're gonna get back together and kind of have a discussion about what we see and what we think about the whole situation. Uh, with what Upton Sinclair was doing. So, we go ahead and pass these pictures out. Get back and look at this. All right, here's your stockyard. Everybody will put that together. That is a stockyard. Everything in that picture is a cow or a pig. I'm not sure which. If you look at the factory, oh, you look at the factory, you see the AR, it's armor. That was one of the four big happy houses. So those are your stockyards. Your animals. Did you get that one? All right. This is what it looked like inside a meatpacking plant. And I want you to look at what they have in their hands.
So, but fun work. If you get a good look at those pictures, go ahead and start to read that little passage. You've each got a different passage. Back in the grinding. Sausage meat also gets stored in large piles that are kept underneath the ceilings and are overrun with rats, so it's filled with rodent feces. Mmm, E. coli. Delicious. Deliciousness. Great. It's really good. I love serious infections. Yeah. So you could die. I bet you nobody in America knew that was where their meat was coming from. Well, some people do. I mean, yeah, the people that were actually like Yeah. I don't know. They're cutting them. They die. Rats, bread, and beef go into the hoppers together. How's that sound? Sounds like a casserole. Of bacteria and poison. Yeah. Not a great casserole. All right. So first, guys, y'all look at the picture of the stockyards. What do y'all see? Lots and lots of pigs. Does that look like a very humane way to uh, dispatch of pigs? No. No, they're piled on top of each other. They're out in the hot sun. They can barely move. Their noses are nose to tail, stuck in these things. So somebody's job would have been to corral the pigs, herd them up through the tunnel all the way to, to the uh, factory. And uh, we won't get into how they... Uh, got rid of the pigs before they processed them. It's pretty gruesome, but it's in the book. But um, it was uh, it was pretty rough. So, um, and then I want you to look at the picture of the people that are doing the work. Look at their hands. What do y'all see? No gloves. No gloves, right? The meats. They got knives in their hands. How close are they together? Very close. So you got guys hacking up piece of meat with knives. Look on the left. There's a guy with a big old square looking thing in his hand. It's a big old bone saw. So we got a guy sawing bones. We got a guy chopping things up and they're doing this for how long did we say? 10 to 12 hours a day and they're making a nickel for every hour they work. So if you're working 12 hours a day and you work six days a week, how many hours a week is that? Six hours a day. 72. 72 hours a week. That's a long week. Yeah. 72 hours times a nickel. Anybody want to do the calculation? 72 times five. 16 times a nickel. 72 times a nickel. Oh, seven, 72 times five. Right, not three hundred and sixty dollars. So in a week, they made what? Three dollars and sixty cents. Why do you think they were willing to do this kind of work? Because apparently, it was not a lot of money. What is? Even then, it's like they needed to. They needed to eat, right? It's like one McDonald's day today. They had families to feed, and guess what? This, at this time in the 1900s, there were literally millions of people coming to the United States. So what happens if you cut your finger or you lost your job at the meatpacking plant? Do you think the meatpacking plant cared? No. no. Right. They do what? Right. They've got literally thousands of people outside in Chicago begging to take these awful, awful jobs. Um, and... Um, the problem, too, is they were easy, and they were easy targets because they were immigrants, okay? Most of them came from Eastern Europe. If you're an immigrant and you come to the United States with a big old pocket full of money, usually if you're coming here to find a better life, 
No, um, so they're, they're easy targets, okay? That's where we get into our next definition, which is exploitation. Okay, yeah. Wouldn't the money that they actually like had like in the country that they were in, would they be able to convert it, or would they just like, no, no, no? No. Don't if, think if they, they came here, they money. usually came here either with the clothes on their back, if they had gold or something like that, sure. But well, like, keep in mind. Lithuanian money, not any good in the United States. So no, if you had a pocket full of, you know, Polish, dollars not really gonna help you here so really people coming over here with the clothes on their back so uh, easy for the owners of these plants for the bosses of these plants to exploit these people so exploitation is important because that's what our muckrakers are looking to expose 